Hi, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, join us today and I uh, hope you find the presentation informative and have lots of questions for us at, at the end. Um, so first, just want to give you a quick agenda of what we're going to be covering today. Uh, we're going to cover who and what can you lean. Uh, we're going to cover how do you perfect and preserve your lien. We're going to cover the process of filing your lien and then how you actually go to foreclose and enforce on your lien. And then we're going to cover what you can you actually recover in your lien foreclosure lawsuit. So first I want to just give a high level overview of construction liens and this is probably things that everyone knows, but let's just cover it quickly. Uh, you know, construction lien rights are created and controlled by statute and they're found in Chapter 713 Florida statutes, which is generally referred to as Florida's construction lien law. You might hear references to mechanics lien law and that also refers to the construction lien law. Construction liens are like uh, essentially like a mortgage. They create an encumbrance on the real property when the lien is filed and recorded in the public records. Uh, lien rights are intended to protect the persons or entities that are doing work to improve real property and improve is a defined term that we'll talk about in the in the lien law. One thing that's important is that lien ors must strictly comply with the requirements of the lien law to perfect and be able to uh, preserve their rights under the lien law. And there's a lot of nuances and specific requirements in the lien law and some potential traps for the unwary that we'll cover uh, in this presentation today. So first we want to talk about uh, the property that is subject to the lien, to the claim of lien. Uh, the lien, when a claim of lien is filed, it attaches to the owner's legal interest in the real property on which the improvements are being constructed. And that's important if because the owner actually has to be the party that's uh, the party to the actual contract. If the party that's contracting for the improvements doesn't actually own the real property, there's not going to be any lien rights to the real property. There may be a breach of contract action between the owner and the contractor, but lien ors are not going to be able to lien the real property if the party contracting for the work is not the owner of the real property. There are some nuances and potential exceptions to that under certain theories like agency or ratification, but it's important and key to understand that the party that's contracting with the contractor actually owns the real property. So real property is defined in the lien law in section 713.0126 to include both the land that is improved and the improvements thereon, including fixtures. So what that means is that if you file a claim of lien for work you're doing on property, the lien is going to apply both to the real property, the dirt, as well as the buildings and the structures on the real property. And one, one nuance here related to property subjects to the lien, if a, 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 a lien or has a contract with a spouse to do work on a residence, for example, and only one spouse, say the husband, signs the contract, well, the lien law says, well, just because the husband signed it, that means the wife is bound by the, the contract for purposes of the lien too, so, so as to protect lien ors. There is one exception to that. If the wife or the husband, depending on who signed the contract, the one who didn't sign, they can uh, within 10 days after learning of the contract, if they record a notice and notify the contractor in the public records, then they, they can uh, protect their ownership interest uh, from a lien. But in the typical case, if one spouse signs, the other spouse's is interest in the property is also going to be subject to the lien. So there's certain types of property that are not subject to construction liens. You know, the, the, the most uh, common one you're going to see is government property, and that applies to state or federal government property. The, the lien law defines in Section 713.0126 that any property owned by the state or any county, municipality, which means a city, any school board or any governmental agency, commission or political subdivision is going to be exempt from lien. So there's a pretty big variety of it. basically any state, local, public work is going to be exempt from a lien. That same thing is going to apply to federal government property, you know, postal service or, or a government, a federal government building. You're not going to have lien rights to any of that property because it's owned by the government. But uh, there's 
the there are bond rights typically for that kind of uh, project and that's something we're going to discuss in more detail in the next uh, webinar but you just understand that for the federal projects you have the miller act that will typically protect uh, subcontractors and suppliers and then on state and local government projects depending on the pro size of the project you'll have the Florida's Little Miller Act which is then Florida statute 255.05. Another uh, quirk related to property that's not subject to a lien comes up in the tenant improvement context. When a tenant uh, enters into a contract for construction work to do improvements under a lease, the tenant's leasehold interest will be subject to the lien. That means the lien would apply to the tenant's rights under its lease with the landlord. In the typical case, if the landlord, um, the landlord's real property, the, the one that actually owns the real property, if the tenant, if the tenant is the one that signs the contract, the landlord's real property will not be subject to a construction lien unless the uh, improvements are required by and essential to the lease. And the case law on this uses the term uh, referred to as the pith of the lease. I have no idea what pith means, but the cases talk, talk about it. Uh, the, the standard is essentially that the, the lease must require that the, uh, that the improvements be made as an essential purpose of the lease and not just a, a case where the tenant is permitted to uh, to make improvements. So in certain cases, if the landlord, uh, if the lease requires a tenant to make improvements, the landlord's uh, interest in the real property may be subject to a construction lien. But as always in the law, there's a big exception to that. And the exception is found in 713.10b Florida statutes. And this provides that even if the lease requires the improvements to be made, it gives the landlord the ability if there's a provision in the lease that prohibits the uh, landlord's uh, property from being subject to the lien and the landlord records a short form or kind of simple form of the lease that contains the provision in the public records prior to the notice of commencement being recorded for the improvements, then the landlord's property is going to be exempt from the lien. That happens very often in the commercial uh, property context. That's something that commercial landlords do as a matter of course. They include this kind of language in their leases and they, they make sure to record those forms. So it's it's oftentimes that the uh, contractor or subcontractor that's working on a tenant improvement project may only have lien rights as to the lease only and not as to the real property. So the next slide talks about entities that do have lien rights and each of these entities uh, except for assignees is a defined term in the lien law and we'll go through some of these but contractors, subcontractors, sub subcontractors, laborers and material men uh, which is really suppliers that's the lien law term for suppliers and design professionals do have lien rights under the construction lien law. So what is what what do some of these terms mean? So subcontractors and sub subcontractors. The lien law defines a subcontractor to mean a person and that means person or entity other than a material man or laborer who enters into a contract with the contractor for perform performance of any part of the contractor's contract. So subcontractor as it makes sense is the party that has a contract a direct contract with the contract the prime contractor. The lien law goes on to define sub subcontractors as a person or entity other than a material man or laborer who enters into a contract with a subcontractor. That makes sense as well for any part of the subcontractor's work. Only subcontractors and sub subcontractors have lien rights. Importantly, third tier subcontractors, so sub sub subcontractors do not have any lien rights under the lien law. So the lien law also defines the term material men and really like we talked about material men as a supplier. So if I use supplier when I'm talking, I also mean material men. It's, it's the same definition and that's in uh, section 713.0120 Florida statutes. 
uh, a material man or a supplier in order to qualify under the lien law must be furnishing materials to an, either an owner directly, a contractor directly, a subcontractor, or a sub subcontractor. Uh, if you're a supplier or a material man to a third tier subcontractor, a sub sub subcontractor, you don't qualify as a material man under the lien law and you do not have lien rights. Similarly, suppliers to suppliers or material men to material men also don't have any lien rights. You have to have a contract with, or you have to be supplying to either the owner, contractor, subcontractor, or sub subcontractor to qualify. There's some other aspects of the material men definition. Uh, the materials actually have to be delivered to the site and incorporated into the improvement to give rise to lien rights. So that means that if uh, materials are just purchased but aren't actually delivered and incorporated, there's there are no lien rights for those materials. The only exception to that is uh, there is the term uh, known as specially fabricated materials. They don't actually have to be incorporated into the project to give rise to lien rights. But that's a limited type of materials, especially fabricated materials are going to be materials that are created specifically for this particular project that can't be reused for another project. So an example might be something that is, you know, uh, cut to a specific size that's very unique to, to a particular uh, project that you can't just take that if, if, and use it on another project because of the unique size or shape. So it's a pretty limited uh, category of, of materials, but but it is an exception to the uh, delivery and incorporation uh, requirement. One thing to note is um, if we go back, please. One thing to note on the specially fabricated materials, uh, when you actually file your claim of lien, you have to specifically designate out the or apportion the amount that relates to specially fabricated materials that weren't delivered to the project uh, site. Uh, there's also no lien rights for materials that are just sold to a customer generally that aren't designated for or incorporated into any particular site. So one other thing here on delivery to the site and incorporation to the project, as you might imagine, that can be kind of an issue for a supplier to prove that its materials were actually incorporated into the project. So the lien law in section 713.0112 expressly provides that if a supplier provides proof of delivery to the project site, that, that constitutes prima facie evidence, which is basically a legal term for that's enough in the first instance for the supplier to meet his burden that it has, uh, that its materials have been incorporated and it has lien rights for those materials. That is a rebuttable presumption, meaning the owner could, if it could uh, come up with evidence to show, well, not notwithstanding the fact that materials were delivered, they weren't actually incorporated. The owner could rebut that presumption, but it, it's harder for the owner to do that. And, and generally proof of delivery is what a supplier is going to need in order to uh, you know, proceed with uh, its lien on uh, materials delivered to the job site. One other uh, aspect, <laughs> one other aspect on that slide, it relates to equipment. Uh, so you, you are entitled as a supplier to the reasonable value of the period of actual use for rental equipment that's provided to the project. Uh, and so that that can be a little bit difficult to determine what that is. Uh, but the lien law does provide that um, the delivery of rental equipment to the site of the improvement is prima facie evidence, meaning again, it kind of puts the burden on the owner that the period of actual use of the rental equipment was from the date of delivery through the date the equipment is last available for use at the site, or two business days after the lessor of the rental equipment receives written notice from the owner or the lessee to pick up the equipment, whichever occurs first. So that's going to be the time frame for which you would be able to uh, have your lien for rental equipment for the reasonable value of the rental equipment is from the date of delivery to the earlier of one of those dates when it's actually picked up or when two day business days after notice is given for picking up the material. Another uh, important nuance for suppliers and material men is in order to qualify, 
they cannot be also performing any labor or installation of the materials. If they are, then they're going to be considered a subcontractor under the lien law. And that's the Arabi Homes uh, versus Bachrock case that's cited there. This can be important because, as we talked about, a supplier to a subcontractor would have lien rights. So a pure material man or supplier to a subcontractor would, or sub, to a sub subcontractor would have lien rights. So if you're a supplier to a second tier subcontractor, you're going to have lien rights. But if that same supplier actually was providing some installation or labor in connection with that, they would be considered a sub sub subcontractor, i.e. a third tier subcontractor and would not have lien rights. So the distinction between supplier and subcontractor can be uh, very important. So this, this next slide is uh, just to try to give you a, a, a chart to help visualize kind of on the contract chain who has lien rights and then where the lien rights are, are cut off. You know, and, and as we kind of talked about, a, you know, a material man to a material man is not going to have lien rights uh, or a sub sub subcontractor, third sub third tier subcontractor is not going to have lien rights. But the parties identified uh, in the upper part of the chart will typically have lien rights. So to kind of summarize what we've talked about about parties that don't have lien rights, um, we talked about third tier subcontractors don't have lien rights, suppliers to a supplier, also suppliers, uh, a fabricator for a supplier is not going to have lien rights sale of goods that aren't designated for any particular project and actually delivered and incorporated. Uh, again, we talked about government property. There's no lien rights there, though you may have bond rights. Uh, on private projects that have a 713 uh, private uh, construction payment bond, uh, there's not going to be lien rights because you'll have bond rights instead. That applies to everybody in the contract chain, except for obviously the contractor that's providing the the uh, private payment bond, which would have lien rights uh, for its work. Unlicensed contractors, if a contractor doesn't have the proper license for the work that it's performing, it under the law is going to have absolutely no lien rights. Now, uh, if a subcontractor is properly licensed or a subcontractor is working under a, a unlicensed contractor, that doesn't mean the subcontractor or the supplier don't have lien rights, but the unlicensed contractor itself will not have any lien rights. And then finally, uh, you know, if an entity files a fraudulent lien, they will lose their lien rights if the lien is determined to be fraudulent. The fraudulent lien statute is Florida Statute 713.31, and essentially it says a lien is fraudulent if it uh, is willfully exaggerated or includes claims for work that was not actually performed, or if it's compiled with such gross negligence that it amounts to a willful exaggeration. A fraudulent lien is a complete defense to the lien claim and uh, strips the lien or of lien rights. Another requirement for lien uh, lien rights is that the work actually has to permanently improve the property. And so with the exception of professional services, the labor services and materials must be part of an improvement which provides a permanent benefit. And that's defined in 713.0115 Florida statutes. So what that means is there's not going to be any lien rights for services that do not permanently improve the property, like cleaning or maintenance or cutting grass. Those kind of things don't make permanent improvements to the property, and so there's not going to be lien rights. There is an exception for uh, cleanup. Uh, if it's the final cleanup uh, to prepare a structure for occupancy, that is in the, in the lien laws defined as a lienable uh, item, but otherwise just, you know, kind of the daily cleanup is not going to be leanable. Uh, an example of a case here talking about the, the landscape maintenance is the legal versus Suncoast Lawn Service, and that's cited there on the slide. And the court there uh, denied the lien claim and held that maintenance landscaping services do not bestow a permanent benefit upon the land and therefore do not entitle a laborer to a mechanics lien. So again, the lien law requires that to be part of a permanent improvement to or provide a permanent benefit to the improvement. So 
So another area where you're not going to have lien rights is for uh, non-scope work. So work that's defective, you're not going to have lien rights for defective work. If you have to you know, spend money to repair defective work, you're not going to have lien rights for that. You know, warranty work, if you have to come back out to correct something under the warranty, you're not going to have lien rights for that. And then as we discussed, unlicensed work uh, by unlicensed or not properly licensed contractors, there's no lien rights for that as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Austin Calhoun, who's going to cover the next section, which uh, relates to perfecting and preserving your lien rights during the project. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so now we know uh, what property can be leaned, who can lean, what work can be leaned. Um, how do you perfect and preserve your lien? Uh, meaning, how do you make sure that it's valid and enforceable and is, is going to ensure that you get paid? Uh, you, know, you have to take action, and these are the steps on the screen that you have to take, and we'll cover each of these. Uh, the first step or, or phase uh, we call due diligence. Uh, there's some investigation and analysis that you need to do or you should do um, as soon as you get a contract, as soon as you start on a project. Uh, the first step, get a copy of the notice of commencement. Uh, also get a copy of the prime contract. Uh, if the general contractor or whoever you're contracting with doesn't give you a copy of the prime contract, uh, then make sure your con your subcontract doesn't incorporate that prime contract by reference or flow down clause. Uh, then, then once you have the contract and the, and the note or the notice of commencement in hand, you can go to the public records, do an easy public record search to to verify who the true owner of the property is. Um, you know, is the party in the chain of contract with the general contractor the, the true owner uh, or is it someone else? Um, then you should also look for the, the lien lease prohibition, which was the memorandum of lease that Ryan mentioned. And at this point, you can figure out uh, what you have lien rights to. Do you have lien rights? Uh, also look for prior liens or mortgages of record. Um, you know, like Ryan said, a, a lien is like a mortgage. And so is your lien going to be a, a second mortgage, a third mortgage? Um, is there any equity in the property? So does your lien have any worth? Um, and then last in the due diligence, you should verify where you're at in the chain of contract. Um, are you in fact a, a sub 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 and you didn't know it? Um, you know, we have a client who's a, um, a major subcontractor and sent a contract uh, to us to review and the first thing we do is due diligence and lo and behold uh, they weren't uh, going to be a subcontractor they were going to be a sub 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 um, because the, the the owner contracted with the, the prime contractor who turned around and contracted out the entire project to another prime contractor and then that prime contractor or that sub contractor Sub, uh, subbed out a portion of the work to another subcontractor, the sub sub, and then that sub sub uh, contracted all of its work to our uh, client. And so they realized they wouldn't have had lien rights and they did not um, enter into that contract. Uh, the notice of commencement, uh, you need to know what it is and how to find it, um, but as a sub or supplier, you're not going to be involved in preparing it. Uh, but it is important for two reasons. Um, the, con it contains the information that you need for preparing your notice to owner and to identify who you have to serve your notice to owner on. Uh, and then it also it preserves your lien priority. Uh, I won't go into that in much detail now, but um, when you later in the project record your claim of lien of record, uh, it relates back to the date of the notice of commencement. If the notice of commencement is still valid uh, and it's only valid for one year uh, unless a different uh, date is stated on the, the notice of commencement or unless it's extended. So you know, that, that's important to know and to keep your eye on. The notice to owner um, pretty common, um, 
you know, what that is. Uh, but some people have a misperception that you know, it's something that an owner or a general contractor is going to get mad about if you as a sub or supplier serve. But it's not. It's a very routine um, document and it's not in a cloud on the title. So it, it in no way harms the owner. What do you need to know about it? Uh, you have to serve it within 45 days. Um, the form is found in Florida statutes and just follow that form. Uh, use the notice of commencement in filling out the notice to owner form and know that if you don't do it or if you do it late, if you do it after 45 days from first furnishing, you have no lien rights. Uh, it's a very strict, strictly construed rule and so you must follow it. So, you know, the notice to owner is not something you should wait to do. You don't wait until payment becomes an issue uh, because then it's likely too late and you've lost your lien right. So just make it part of your standard um, routine for any new contract you get, any new order. Lien waivers or releases, um, that, that term waiver and release is used interchangeably here. Uh, they're conditional or unconditional. And conditional means they're only effective if you received payment. Unconditional means they're effective even if you did not get paid. Uh, that's a pretty important distinction because you're giving away your lien rights by that waiver, uh, but you didn't get paid. Uh, so that's probably not what you intended. So you're probably giving away more than you intend there. Uh, so you know, don't give away uh, an un or don't give an unconditional release until you've been paid. And um, of note there, uh, the Florida statutes has has forms for lien releases and the form um, has been determined by courts to be unconditional. There's some language in the form, the statutory form that some subs and suppliers uh, read to make it conditional, uh, but it is in fact not. Uh, there are two different types of lien waivers, either a through a date or for the, a some certain. Uh, that's an important distinction and there's some traps for the unwary uh, based on that distinction. Uh, we prefer uh, that you provide releases for a some certain. You know, that's the, the dollar amount um, that you're seeking to be paid and so you're releasing only your lien rights in that dollar amount. Uh, the through date form of lien waiver releases all of all of your rights through that date, um, regardless of whether you received any payment for the work performed through that date. And the trap uh, that we see often is either unapproved change orders or claims uh, that you, you have a change order that you submitted before your lien waiver. Um, the contractor hasn't approved it yet, so you haven't included it in your pay request or invoice. Um, but the work was done before the date of your lien release, so now you have no lien rights uh, in that change order. Uh, I won't bore you with all the details of this case, but it's a it's a good example of the importance of the language in a lien waiver and the effect, the, the substantial effect it can have on you in your uh, right to get paid. Um, so the done was the GC, uh, subbed out work to Spectrum. Spectrum turned around and sub by sub subcontract um, gave work to EWI. Um, EWI did their work, they did it just fine, but uh, didn't get paid. Um, and one of the lien releases that EWI provided um, had some unique language in it. Uh, and it's, it's on your screen there, um, but in sum, uh, it assigned any uh, claim that it had for payment uh, to the general contractor. So EWI's claim for payment against Spectrum, it assigned to uh, the GC and, and also released its uh, right uh, through a date certain. 
So it, it released the, you know, the lien release it, that uh, EWI provided was a through date certain release through the date of September 30th, 2003. Um, so EWI was owed more than a million dollars, filed a lawsuit. Um, in the first lawsuit, the jury in the, the, the trial court awarded the full amount, uh, the million dollars. However, um, Spectrum appealed um, and the basis of its appeal was that was that lien waiver, that through date lien waiver that EWI had provided, um, that it you know, waived its right for all work prior to September 30th, 2003. Uh, the appellate court agreed and um, ultimately EWI was only awarded uh, $530,000. So half of what it was actually owed. So even though it was actually owed um, more than $500,000 for work before September 30th, it wasn't entitled to it due to the release. Because it that the release released more than just its lien rights. Some practical tips. Uh, check your contract when in, when you're negotiating your contract look for lien release requirements. Uh, what is the type of lien release? Uh, what rights are you required to give away? Um, and only agree to use the statutory form or a form that you approve. Um, so that's when you're negotiating your contract and it's something you should pay attention to. Also throughout the course of the project, um, if the when the contractor uh, requests you provide a lien release, um, make sure that uh, the release they're asking for comports with your contract's requirement. This is the only uh, type of release that they can require from you uh, is the ones set forth in the statute or if um, described in your contract. So if they're asking for anything else, um, you're not required to give it to them. And again, um, strive to only provide the some certain type of release. Um, and if you do have to provide a through date release, make sure that your billing is accurate and that you've included um, all costs uh, through that date in your in your billing. And pay attention to any unapproved uh, change orders or um, retainage uh, that you haven't billed for yet, but incurred prior to that date. Uh, this is a, a handy table to uh, tell you the steps you have to take to um, perfect your lien rights and when you have to, to do it. Um, the notice to owner you know, within 45 days of first furnishing, um, you have to serve that on the owner, but as a um, sub-sub or a supplier to a sub-sub, uh, you have to provide copy to the, the contractor. You know, I suggest that you just make that a matter of course, make that your, your, your normal practice that your NTO goes to the owner and the, the prime contractor. Uh, at the, you know, when you find yourself unpaid and it's time to record your claim of lien, uh, you have to do it within 90 days of final furnishing. Um, you know, final furnishing is a uh, hotly debated term in some, it's you know, the last day you did new work or the last day you provided uh, new materials. If you if you don't record your lien within those within in that 90 days, um, you're out of luck. You no longer have lien rights. Uh, also note that if you have to amend your claim of lien because, you know, for instance, um, you missed some money um, in your initial calculation and you want to increase your lien amount, uh, you have to file that amendment within the 90 days as well. You, you cannot amend after the 90 days. Uh, and then uh, there is another step that you must take after recording your claim of lien. You have to serve a copy of that recorded lien uh, on the owner and you, you have to do that within 15 days of recording. Um, and then uh, the last thing for me to discuss before I turn it over to my partner Joby, uh, these are just you know, on the screen uh, two uh, statutory mechanisms that you need to be on the lookout for. And if you if you see them, if you're presented with one of these, 
uh, you must take it seriously because there's real uh, you know, and important uh, ramifications. You know, the first one, uh, request for a sworn statement of account. You know, that may come from the owner you know, asking you to, to swear uh, how much you've been paid and how much work you have left to do. If you don't properly and timely respond within 30 days, uh, you have uh, lost your lien rights. Uh, the affidavit of recommencement uh, is slightly more complicated and, and that, that occurs uh, typically when the owner uh, terminates the original contractor and replaces that contractor. Um, you know, in, in that event, a new notice of commencement is required. And you know, what, what you need to know is if, if you become aware of that and per statute, um, the owner is required to make you aware of it, uh, that you need to record your lien within 30 days. Um, or um, if you don't, you're going to lose your lien priority. You know, you're going to go to the end of the line. All right, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, to Joby to wrap it up. Thanks, thanks, Austin. Um, last part of the presentation is going to involve a preparing claim of lien, and then uh, what happens after you record the lien and uh, potentially get involved in a lawsuit or are seeking to collect on uh, monies owed uh, on that lien. So most of you listening to this or watching this uh, webinar probably seen or probably maybe even prepared a claim of lien uh, like just about everything that we've discussed in this presentation it's all statutory statutorily driven there are uh, forms particularly for a claim of lien in chapter 713 which uh, pretty much everything that we've been talking about today um, is addressed uh, one way or the other in that uh, section of the statute, chapter 713. Uh, so 713.08 talks about who can prepare the lien, uh, who must prepare the lien. And most important thing about preparing the lien uh, is that it needs to be prepared by someone who's authorized to do it. Uh, don't hire someone or a service to prepare it for you. Um, that could invalidate your lien. Uh, make sure that the person who's preparing it uh, has authority to prepare it and understands what's going into the claim of lien. Uh, keep in mind that if you get in litigation that the person who signed the lien will be a witness uh, in the lawsuit. So make sure that the person uh, preparing it is authorized to do it and certainly uh, a lien or as employee or an attorney of the lien or uh, are authorized to prepare the claim of lien. Typically uh, lawyers don't uh, want to prepare the claim of lien because they're probably going to be representing that particular party in a lawsuit. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, the, the, the signatory to the lien is going to probably be a witness in the case. So you don't want your lawyer uh, being a witness in the case. Uh, this Florida Bar versus Carmel or Carmel case is an interesting one. I, I won't go into all the, the details, but what this case says is that um, a, a lien service uh, cannot prepare and sign uh, a uh, claim of lien that is a uh, that is uh, potentially uh, well not potentially that is the unlicensed practice of law uh, if you're a non-lawyer or um, not an employee or authorized agent of the company so many times I see uh, clients and, and and other folks have a, a lien service that handles uh, notices to owner and other types of notices and, and potentially even um, re recording liens. Want to be careful with that. Um, sometimes they do it right, sometimes they don't, but if, if they should not be signing liens uh, for anyone um, that's doing work on the project that's not allowed. Uh, again, holding in this case, Supreme Court of Florida agreed with the Florida Bar that uh, this particular company by engaging in this practice was causing grievous and irreparable harm to individuals, issued a permanent injunction, uh, keeping this company from engaging in the practice of law in the state of Florida. 
So the, the point of this is, um, you know, m most most clients and, and most folks in the construction industry understand the the significance, the importance uh, of getting the lien right and doing it correctly and making sure that it's accurate. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to guard against here by just letting anybody prepare a claim of lien and record it is uh, someone who doesn't know all the information, uh, isn't being honest, and um, so just trying to avoid that. Let's talk about what's recoverable under your lien. So you've now you've now prepared your lien and you are getting ready to or you've recorded it in the public records and uh, at some point you make a decision on uh, filing a lawsuit to foreclose on your lien. So think of a, for those of you who have not participated in the process, it's similar to a mortgage foreclosure uh, situation. Uh, oftentimes a, a lawsuit involving a lien foreclosure is going to also involve some other cause of action, uh, whether it's a breach of contract or something else. Uh, those are the typical ways in which these claims are brought, but it could just be a straight up uh, construction lien foreclosure case. And so you can um, recover uh, the various things on the screen, uh, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. But keep in mind, um, I have clients and folks ask me all the time, well, I, I, I don't have lien rights or I lost my lien rights because I didn't get, get with you soon enough or we didn't know to do this, that and the other. So you, you still potentially have contract rights. So you can have lien rights and you can have contract rights, but just because you don't have lien rights doesn't mean you don't have the ability to uh, get damages for a breach of contract claim. And, and a lot of times people don't recognize that, you know, the lien at the end of the day may not be worth a lot. Um, I think we talked about earlier in the presentation, you know, what, what is the piece of property worth uh, that you're trying, that you've recorded a lien on and you're um, you're now trying to foreclose on. If there is a uh, $7 million uh, mortgage on a piece of property and it's only worth three um, and your lien is a million dollars or whatever the number is, um, there isn't going to be much money there, if any, uh, related to your lien claim. But that doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to recover under some other type of cause of action. Attorney's fees, it's a, it's, a, it's a question that every client and um, lawyer should look at in determining whether or not uh, a lawsuit is, is something worth pursuing. The statute applicable here as it relates to lien claims is 713.29. Under, under Florida law, you can only get your attorney's fees by contract or by statute. Now, there are some other um, procedural ways in which you can implicate attorney's fees, but start with the premise of you only get your fees, your attorney's fees, if there is a statute or a contract that authorizes it. In this case, if you're traveling under a lien foreclosure lawsuit, the lien law, Chapter 713, specifically 713.29, allows the prevailing party to recover its attorney's fees. So you might say, well, great, uh, that's that's another reason to file a lawsuit. I can get my attorney's fees if I prevail, um, but not so fast. And this is sometimes um, confusing and um, uh, clients don't uh, understand the court's rulings in some of these cases where it's not automatic that the court is going to find is going to find a prevailing party. So. For example, you might have a, a party who is defending against a lien claim and says it's owed uh, $500,000 for a contractor's problems on a job. The contractor liens the job for uh, $75,000 and um, the judge determines that the contractor is owed a smaller portion of what the lien was and determines that the uh, that the owner is owed something and ultimately determines that there's no prevailing party there. So no one gets their fees. Um, so keep that in mind when you're, you know, talking with whoever you talk with to determine whether uh, a lawsuit is viable is that even though the statute pro provides for prevailing party attorney's fees, a court could ultimately determine that there is no prevailing party and nobody gets fees. 
not a great result. Transfer bonds. Um, this is a this is something that happens after a lien is recorded. It's pursuant to 713.24. And basically a what happens here is a a lien gets recorded and for whatever reason, whether uh, an owner is trying to sell the property and wants to clear it from any liens or encumbrances or the owner says there's a subcontractor lien on my property, Mr. General Contractor, Mrs. General Contractor, your contract requires that um, you remove uh, that lien from my property. And so um, what ends up happening is there is a lien transfer bond recorded that then uh, substitutes in for the lien. There is no lien on the property at that point. And there's a statutory mechanism to figure out how much that transfer bond is for. That's the amount of the lien plus interest at the legal rate for three years, plus $1,000 or 25%, whichever is greater. You need to pay attention to that um, situation as a lien or you'll get something uh, giving you a, a notice that the lien has been transferred to a bond. And um, sometimes that happens in the context of a lawsuit. There's a lien foreclosure action filed. The lien gets transferred to a bond. And then there are some uh, amendments that need to be made to the filings. It's no longer a lien foreclosure action. It's an action on a transfer bond. Some really important things to be aware of that um, can create real problems for you if you're not paying attention. Once you record your lien, um, hopefully uh, everybody on this call has a mechanism, uh, a safety net in place where uh, someone in your office or your offices is uh, culling the mail and making sure that anything related to that lien uh, gets in the hands of the right person or persons. Um, I can tell you that I've, I've been involved in several examples where um, folks have received the, the documents that uh, we're talking about and um, don't know what to do with them or they, they don't get logged in and um, next thing you know, uh, they might not have lien rights. So um, want to be careful once, once the lien is recorded, let everybody know in your office to be on the speaking to dealing with that lien um, because there's probably going to be some timing requirement associated with it that if you don't follow, you will lose your lien rights. So what are those few things? So there is a request for statement of account. That's under 713.16. There is a notice of contest of lien, 713.22, and what's called a show cause complaint uh, under 713.21. So if you see any of those documents, um, those need to, you, th your antenna should be raised at that point and um, speak with whoever it is that, that uh, handles your, your lien matters, your lawyer, um, because this can have very serious repercussions if you don't act swiftly. Let's talk about the request for sworn statement of account. Um, this is again governed by 713.16. Um, ho hopefully, um, you, some of you probably have seen this document before. Um, client gets it, d doesn't exactly know what to do with it, but what they're asking for is tell me, the owner wants to know or someone wants to know, tell me what is still owed uh, on this job. And that's a, that's a fair ask because the owner may not know what all the subs uh, are owed by the general contractor thinking that they've paid the general contractor everything is due they're wanting to do their homework so they send out this document uh, obviously if you get it um, you need to be honest with the information that you put in it because there are uh, criminal uh, re repercussions for not being honest in filling out that uh, that document and failing or refusing to provide the information within 30 days will deprive you of your lien rights so if you get that request for sworn statement of account, make sure you, you fill it out uh, or have the appropriate people fill it out. Make sure it gets, gets uh, you respond to it timely or your lien rights will be gone. Notice of contest of lien. Um, again, similar mechanism. These are all, these are all tricks sometimes that people employ to um, 
get you to sleep on your lien rights and next thing you know uh, it's too late you didn't respond and the lien is gone gone by operation of law so this is one where uh, again governed by the uh, chapter 713 and it's a 60 day time frame so the the owner um, sends out a notice of contest of lien and then requires the lien or to uh, foreclose the, the lien within 60 days from the notice was mailed. Uh, I can tell you that I, in a recent example, uh, I was involved and involved in uh, a matter where um, two lawyers were involved. Uh, the uh, client sent a, uh, the, the owner sent a uh, notice of contest of lien to my client, not to me. Uh, and uh, fortunately, my client uh, was is savvy enough to know about these kinds of things, and we were able to to make sure that the um, lawsuit was brought in a timely manner. But but those types of things, without that sort of heads up and knowledge of of what these documents do, it, it really can have serious effects on your ability to recover. So don't miss that 60 day window. If you get a notice of contest of lien, um, that should be. Uh, you, that should put you on notice that you've got to do something within that 60 day period, which is foreclosing your lawsuit, because typically uh, you have one year after you record your lien to foreclose. That's your that's your your absolute drop dead deadline to foreclose on your lien, uh, your, your lien claim. But these uh, mechanisms that we're talking about, the notice of contest of lien and the show cause complaint, which is what we're talking about next, those really shorten uh, the time period from doing it, obviously. In this case, results in a 60 day time frame to foreclose. And in the next slide, you'll see it's a 20 day time frame to foreclose. So show cause complaint. This is again uh, governed by Chapter 713 of the Florida statutes. This is one where um, you have a really, really short period of time within which to foreclose. Again, typically you have one year. You get a show cause complaint and you don't file your lawsuit within 20 days to foreclose that that claim of lien. Um, your your lien's gone. Now there is there is uh, some wiggle room in the statute that talks about requiring the lien or to show why his or her lien should not be enforced by a foreclosure action. Um, I don't get into that uh, situation. I don't I don't want to I don't want to get into an argument with anyone that we didn't um, say that in our filings. We just go ahead and we foreclose on our lien within that 20 day period. Can't go wrong uh, with that response to a show cause complaint. But but obviously you've now got 20 days versus a year, so you want to make sure you're vigilant there. Uh, obviously, if the um, if the lien or does not take that requisite action, the lien is gone. Um, a lot of times people will ask me about uh, their their contractual requirements and and pay if paid, pay when paid provisions. Uh, obviously, um, you need to make sure that you understand how your payment uh, terms work in your subcontract. That's one of the most critical components of a contract is how and when and how much you're going to get paid. And most of the folks on this webinar probably have heard uh, pay if paid versus pay when paid, but but a pay if paid, a valid pay if paid provision as it relates to subcontractors and suppliers means that if the owner has not paid the general contractor for the subcontractors or suppliers work, then the general contractor has no obligation to then pay the um, the subcontractor and supplier. Obviously, uh, with subcontractors and supplier. Uh, contracts, you'd prefer not to have that provision in there, uh, but they're in a lot of contracts that I review standard fare. Uh, so understand that, which is which is different than a pay when paid uh, provision, which basically requires the general contractor to pay a subcontractor or a supplier within a reasonable period of time, uh, notwithstanding whether or not uh, the general contractor has been paid by the owner. So you'd obviously like to have that pay when paid versus pay if paid in your subcontractor supplier agreements, but I realize that there's probably not a lot of negotiation allowed or, or um, 
uh, available when it comes to that section. So you're probably going to have a pay if paid provision in there. So what does that mean for for subcontractors and suppliers? Certainly the pay if paid provision, as long as it's got the right bells and whistles on it, is going to be enforceable under Florida law. There's nothing that uh, uh, prevents a general contractor from including those provisions if properly worded in, in their downstream contracts. Nevertheless, even if you have a pay if paid provision in your subcontract supplier agreement, that does not mean that you do not have lien rights. You, you, you have a right to be paid your 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 re, your recourse may not be against the general contractor if in fact the general contractor has not been paid for your work if if the general contractor has been paid that's a different story but you still would be able to foreclose uh, assuming you are in the um, uh, you have the the right to um, record a construction lien, meaning you're you're not so far down the food chain that you you don't have lien rights and you've done all the other things to per, to perfect your lien rights, you still would be able to record your claim of lien and foreclose on that lien because you're you're at that point you are going against the owner who has not paid for your work. So that's the protection that you have uh, notwithstanding a pay if paid provision in your subcontract. With that, I don't have any uh, anything else to say about what happens after you record your lien and think about getting involved in a lawsuit and, and while you're in the lawsuit, but I would like to remind you that we have another uh, uh, part of our webinar series. It's part three bond law, which I hope you will join us on July 16th, beginning at noon. And with that, um, we are a little short on time, but we want to try to at least get to maybe one or two of these questions here if we can. Um, the first question that we have is, um, if the owner actually knows you are working on the project, do you still have to send a notice to owner? So you guys let me know which one of you wants to take it, but I just want to remind everyone that if there are questions here, you can uh, easily submit them by clicking on the Q&A option on your screen there. So who wants to take if the owner actually knows you're working on the project, do you still have to send a notice to owner? Hey, Nikos, this is Austin. Uh, I'll take that one. Uh, and the answer is pretty simple. Uh, yes, you still have to serve your notice to owner. Uh, the owner's actual knowledge of you working on that project is not sufficient to satisfy that statutory requirement. So send your notice to owner um, no matter what. Very good. And then here's another one here. It says for tenant improvement work, how can I determine if a lease contains a prohibition on liens on the landlord's property? Ryan, I think you might be the best person to answer that. I don't know if you're muted or not, but um, if you're still, what do you think about that? Yes, I was muted. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, uh, I can answer that question. So there's there's two ways. You know, one, you can you can actually do a public record search to see if they've recorded the memo of lease with the prohibition. Uh, but the statute itself actually also gives uh, a contractor or any lien or the right to serve a written demand on the landlord for a verified copy of the lease provision that prohibits liability for liens. Uh, so you can find out that way. And actually, if the landlord does not uh, provide that uh, in a sworn statement within 30 days from that demand, or if the landlord provides something that's false or fraudulent, then the lien or will actually then have lien rights uh, as long as the lien or did not have actual knowledge of the lease prohibition provision. So one, you can check the public records. Two, you can make that written demand to the landlord directly. Very good. Thanks, Ryan. Um, here's another one. It says, can I email my lien or notice to owner to satisfy my notice requirements? Good question. You might be able to take that one. Question again was, can I email my lien or notice uh, to the owner to satisfy my notice requirements. Oh, it's, 
Okay. This is a question I think you might be able to answer if you want to answer it. It says, can I answer right here? Yeah, it says, can I email my lien or notice to owner to satisfy my notice requirements? Sorry about that. I had some technical difficulties. Uh, the answer to that question is no, you cannot. Uh, although I would suggest that you uh, follow the statutory requirements for notice, which is some sort of certified mail return receipt requested. But if you have an email address, I would also email it. Uh, that will get there faster. Um, so that's not in lieu of, that's an addition to, um, but that's not gonna be sufficient for purposes of satisfying the notice requirements under chapter 713. Thanks, Joby, I appreciate that. Well, out of respect for everybody's time here, we appreciate you hanging in there with us. We ran a little bit long on this one, um, but yeah, we'll definitely uh, be continuing this series. Like Joby said, it's coming up. Uh, in July, another one for subs and um, the suppliers. And if you have any questions today for any of these presenters that maybe you didn't get around to asking or you'd like to ask after the fact, their contact information is there on the screen. You can find their full bios at jimmersonfirm.com. Give us a call at 904-389-0050. Be happy to help you guys with um, any of the issues that you may be confronted with or facing. But for now, that concludes our presentation and we will look forward to seeing you guys again in July.